seeing that we are entering a new year, I constructed a message titled, All Things New. All Things New. This will be part one. We have a God who promises to make all things new. That's a wonderful thing. For one, because we need new. If you look around you, everything's getting old. Everything's wasting. Everything's fading. But the Lord, our God, is the only one who has the absolute power to make everything new. And that's a good thing because every new year gets old. <laughs> Just like this one. And no matter how this year plays out, it may be the best year of our lives, it may be the worst year of our lives, we are assured of a perfect future. It's the reason why I don't worry about anything. Why? Because my future is perfect and it's secured. And we serve a God who cannot lie. An eternal future with the God who makes all things new. This is the sure hope. This is the sure and solid hope that every true child of God has. And I would have you know that nothing can change that. Nothing and no one can change that. If you're his, you're his forever. And one day we will be with the God who has made all things new. We're going to get there and say, wow, it was true. <laughs> he did make all things new. I'm going to give you a kind of list, and this is not an exhaustive one, by the way. Of all the things that God makes new, God makes many things new. But first, Revelation 21 and verse 5, I'll just read it to you. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. This was when everything is finally finished, done. He even says, It is done, it is complete. He says, behold, I make all things new. Do you understand that you serve the God who is looking forward to make everything new, brand new, for our good, for his glory? Because everything that God has created in one way or another has been tainted and affected and infected by sin. And God wants to make all things new. Now, there are two Greek words for the word new. The first one is kainos, meaning to make something brand new, as in something that has never been before. And the second word is neos, which means to renew, to refresh, to restore something. And the Greek word for the word new used here in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 5a is the first word. Kainos, which means that God will not just restore the old, he will make all things altogether brand new. He's not going to restore anything necessarily. He is going to recreate something brand spanking new. How many of you like new? I like new. This is incredible. He's going to do something that he has never done before. He's going to do something that he has never done before. Due to the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, also known as original sin, just about everything has been corrupted. Just look around you. Just about everything gets old and dies, including you and I. Can I get an amen or an ouch? <clears throat> This is called entropy, which means disorder and decline. That, that is the effect of the fall. Everything is depleting right before our very eyes. Things are getting old and things are dying. I mean, just look in the mirror every day for 70 years or more. And entropy, which means that the human body is wasting away. Our eyes grow dim, our teeth fall out, 
Our hair turns gray. Our knees don't work eventually. In other words, just about everything is depleting. Everything is fading away. Everything. That's the reason why God says, Behold, I make all things new. I'm happy about that. I rejoice over that. That's my solid hope. That's why I don't worry. That's why I don't lose any sleep. That's why I'm not afraid of anything. Just heights. That's a whole different problem. (laughs) But if I fall, I'm good. (laughs) Probably better off. So much better in heaven than here anyway. Everything from heavenly bodies such as stars and planets to earthly bodies such as humans and animals, everything is depleting, fading away. And so if sin is the cause of death, if sin is the cause of all of this corruption, all of this fading away, all of this dying, then sin and death must be totally defeated in order for this fallenness, listen, to never happen again, right? If, if sin and death is the reason why all of this in ha- is happening, then sin and death must be totally and completely dealt with. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to read verses 22 to 26. We're going to see that our Lord defeats the last enemy called death. At that time, no more entropy and no more atrophy, no more depleting. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 to 26 says this, pay close attention. Even more attention than you do your phones at times. Just a loving staff, boom, right on the side. Verse 22, for as in Adam all die. In Adam all what? They all die. We all die. We've been dying since Adam first died. We keep on dying today. And everyone you love dies. And everyone who is famous and rich dies. And everyone who is unknown and unnamed dies. Everyone dies. That's a fact. Ten out of ten people die. Unless, of course, you're raptured. Like uh, Enoch and Elijah. It says here, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, that means Christ rises from the dead first to never die again. Afterward, those who are Christ or belong to Christ at his coming. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, When he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Death is the reason for all of this tragedy. And he's going to finally put death to death. Once and for all. After the great white throne judgment. And it's been made known to all regarding who will be in heaven and who will be in hell forever. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 14 says this and I'll read it to you. Then death. Then death. And Hades which is the realm of the dead, a kind of pre-lake of fire prison. So death and those in hell waiting for the great white throne judgment were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. God destroys all sin, all unrepented sinners. God destroys death. In other words, Sin, which produces death, will never, ever hinder God's new creation again. There are some people that say, is Satan going to do this again? Is Eve going to bite another forbidden fruit in heaven? No. 
There will be no more sin in heaven because death is done away with. And I just would have you know that sin and death are synonymous. You can't have one without the other. So if he destroys death, he's destroying sin. And the reason is that sin and death will never hinder God's new creation again is because both fallen angels and Jesus rejecting humans who are still able to sin will be securely punished in hell forever. Revelation chapter 20 and Revelation chapter 21. God will once and for all get rid of everyone who is still able to sin. That's sad news. That's absolute terrible news for those who reject Christ. Because they'll be in a place where they can no longer hinder the holiness, the goodness, the love, the greatness and the glory of our God. They will be in hell. Sin and death are put away. That's why I say come to Jesus now if you don't have him. And so he will destroy sin and death. He will make all things new in connection to that reality. Revelation 21 and verse 27 makes this very clear, referring to the new Jerusalem, the heavenly city. Turn your Bibles to Revelation 21 and verse 27. I want you to see here that those who are still able to sin will not be there. But there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Do you notice that God is saying in this new Jerusalem, in the new heavens and the new earth, Nothing and no one who is still defiled will be allowed to come in to defile heaven, to defile the new Jerusalem. There will not be any perverted rap songs played in heaven. There won't be any perverted jokes said in heaven. There won't be anything nasty happening in heaven. No lies will be told in heaven. No evil intentions. No bad thoughts, no thievery, no murders. Everything that makes earth much like hell will not be allowed in God's new heaven. Why? Because he's a good God. And he's going to prove it on that day when he separates the sheep from the goats for his glory. What side are you on, my dear friend? It says, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. (laughs) Who's getting into heaven and can no longer sin because they've been glorified? Those who have their names written in the Lamb's book of life. Who are those? Those who have placed their trust in the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I trust in Jesus. There's your name. I love Jesus. I follow Jesus. I obey Jesus. There's your name. Written in the Lamb's book of life, which will someday be open. And everyone who was ever created since the day God made Adam will know who was and who was not written in the Lamb's book of life. And those of us who are made new will never be able to sin against God again. If there was a little switch where that can happen right now, No more sinning against God in any way, shape, or form. Done. Don't want to sin against God anymore. Don't want to hurt me. Don't want to hurt anybody else completely. Just turn it off. Any and every ability to sin against my holy God, turn it off. And one day when I'm in heaven, that will be turned off. And I'm going to say, thank you, Jesus. I'm not going to hurt anybody anymore. 
I'm going to worship you and honor you with every thought, with every action, with every deed, with every word. No more filth in the glory and the presence of God. The more you know him, the more you know his worth, the more you know his holiness, the more you want that to happen now. No more kids getting trafficked or molested. No more blue pill demons being sold for a dollar, killing people by the thousands. No more slandering people. No more lying. No more gambling. No more drinking yourself to death. No more listening to corrupted and corroded music or watching filth on that screen. It's done. All glory be to God. I don't want to see another bad thing for all of eternity when I get there. Not one. Not in me and not in anyone else. And God wants that more than me, more than you, more than anybody. Sin will be totally stripped from our hearts and minds. Take it, Lord, all of it. And therefore, we will never experience death again. Why? Because sin produces death. And in heaven, there's no sin. So there's no more death. But in hell, that's the second death. Why? Because they rejected Jesus Christ, who is eternal life. And so they're in a state of death that is separation from God forever. Sin will be totally stripped from our minds and our hearts. And therefore, we will never experience death again because, again, sin produces death. And death is finally cast into the lake of fire forever. I rejoice with every ounce of my being over this reality. Because I've seen a lot. And I've heard a lot. And I'm sick and tired of the devil. I'm sick and tired of my flesh, and I'm sick and tired of this crooked, Christ-hating, people-hating world we live in. Done. I'm checked out. <laughs> I don't even know why God has me here. I'm so checked out. I'm just saying, and I mean it. You can ask Marla, and Blue, and Damien. And Joe's at the house all the time. You can ask him too. <laughs> okay, now let's get into our list of the things that God makes brand new. Kainos, brand new. Something altogether different and new. We're going to begin with, number one, the new covenant. I hope you guys have nothing to do later on today because we have about a hundred of these, Okay. <laughs> I'm kidding, and I'm not going to tell you how many we have. <laughs> I love the suspense, you know. <laughs> He's on 89. <laughs> Number one, enough joking. Number one. In Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 31, Yahweh God says this, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. The reason why he says the house of Israel and Judah was because at that time the kingdom was split in two. But he's talking about his people Israel. I will make a new covenant with my chosen and elect Old Testament people. But keep in mind that this new covenant includes the church. It includes you and I. Why? Because the Bible says that we were engrafted by faith into the people of Israel, because we have the same faith as Abraham does in the same Messiah, Jesus the Lord. And so the new covenant is not just for them, it's also for us. The new covenant was a promise God made to someday, listen closely, verse 33 says, write the law, that is his words, write the law, write the law in their minds and in their hearts. And verse 34 says, and to forgive their sins. 
This is to completely, completely eradicate all sin from their lives. And this was to be done by the death of Jesus for our sin and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. How does God give us a new mind and a new heart? Through the Word of God, through the person of the Holy Spirit. Our minds are being renewed all the time. Like right now, your mind is being renewed. You're thinking biblically. You're thinking heavenly. Why? Because God's Word is being read. And so then, God not only wants you to have a new mind, and not the mind of the world, but the mind of Christ, He also wants you to have new affections. That's why it says here, and on their hearts. What has King David said? I have hid your word in my heart, that I may not sin against you. New affections, obedience. The Old Covenant consisted of the Ten Commandments, that is to love God and love others, being written on two stone tablets. You remember that, Moses? And animal sacrifices to die in the place of lawbreakers for the forgiveness of sin. So the Old Covenant had to do with the law being written on stone and animals dying in Israel's place. And no one but Jesus was able to perfectly obey God's laws. That's why no sacrifice was made for him. He is the sacrifice. He didn't die because he sinned. He died because you sinned and I sinned. The new covenant consists of God's law, that is God's word, being written on our hearts by the power and person of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus' death on the cross replaced all Old Testament animal sacrifices because they were imperfect. (laughs) This had to be done year by year. In fact, I'll read Hebrews 10, 3 to 4 to you. It says this, but in those sacrifices, that is the animal sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. God wants to do away with that reminder of sins every year. Verse 4, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. And then it goes on to say from verse 5 to 7, that Jesus is the perfect sacrifice, better than animals. He is the word made flesh, and that he takes away sin once and for all. I'm forgiven. Past, present, and future. And when I get to heaven, Jesus will never die again. Sin is completely dealt with. Can I get an amen? Amen. In Matthew 26 and verse 28, Jesus says, For this is my blood of the new covenant, speaking about taking part in the Lord's Supper, the bread and the wine, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So we see here that um, Holy Spirit put the word in our hearts, And Jesus Christ came to die, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, replacing all animal sacrifices because they were not cutting it. Because they were not God. Only God can please God. That's why God the Father had to send God the Son to die in our place. Jesus' birth, life, and death, and resurrection is what began to make all things new. Jesus is our divine superhero. God began to make all things new in us. Again, by writing his word on our minds and our hearts and by washing away all of our sins, all of our filth. Again, past, present, and future. So number one, what is the thing that God makes new? The new covenant. Number two, the new birth. The new birth. In John chapter 3 and verse 3, Jesus tells Nicodemus, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And verse 5 says, Nor enter the kingdom of God. That's pretty serious. Are you born again? 
Because if you're not, you can't see the kingdom. And you're not allowed in. Why? Because eventually you would defile it. And remember, nothing that can defile it will be allowed in. So the born again experience starts here, starts now. And the glorification, that is the absolute perfection, takes place in heaven. All who are not born again, because we are all born once, physically speaking, you can't deny that, or else you wouldn't be here today. You came out of your mama's womb. And those who are born again are born of the Spirit, or born twice, spiritually speaking. All who are not born again are spiritually blinded to the goodness, the beauty, the power, and the love of God. They cannot see God in Jesus and they cannot enter heaven. Why? Because we must be made new in Christ in order to be accepted by God the Father who is sinless. So it's not good enough that you're just born one time. Physically. You must be born again. Spiritually. Where you have a new father, God the Father. You have a new family. So then being born again is an absolute must. Jesus told Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you will remain blind and you will remain outside of the kingdom of God. You ain't getting in. And your righteousness and your good deeds apart from Christ are as filthy rags, the Bible says. You need Jesus. You need him. You're not getting in. It says, unless you are born again, you are blind and you are unwelcomed into his eternal kingdom. But today's the day. They're not born again. Trust in Christ now. Trust in Him now because you just never know. 1 Peter 1.23 says, Having been born again, not of corruptible seed. In other words, this is referring to our human fathers. That's corruptible seed. My dad died, I'm going to die too. But it says here, But incorruptible referring to the Holy Spirit through the Word of God which lives and abides forever. How were you born again? By the power of God. That's how you were born again if you were born again. You didn't make it happen. I didn't make it happen. God made it happen. In His own grace, goodness, and mercy, He brings those who are dead to life if they turn from their sin and trust in Christ truly for salvation. Number three. All things new. Number three, the new heart. And as you can see, it's all connected. The new heart slash the new spirit. Turn your Bibles to Ezekiel 36. We're going to read from verses 26 to 27. When you're there, go and say amen. Amen. Verse 26 says this, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes that is the written laws of God mm -hmm. and you will keep my judgments and do them mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if you remember what you were like before you were born again I mean even when we're born again we, we, we have some bad days gonna get they made it out but before that, we almost had no power. I should say we had no power to truly please God. But he says here, I will do it. I see you need a new heart to love me. I'll give it to you. I, say, I see you need a new mind to think about me. I'll give it to you. 
I see you're dying and you want to live forever. I'll give it to you. This is new covenant power. When God gives us a new heart, we know it. When God gives us a new heart, we know it. Because the evil things that we used to love, we now, for the most part, hate. There was a kind of music that I used to listen to. And I used to bob my head like a little parrot, enjoying that music. All of the words, all of the fill. You put it on now, and, and I can't hear a few seconds of it. Right away, I already know what the filth is. I know my God doesn't like it. I hate it too. Used to love it. Used to bump it <laughs> back in the days. Now I'm like, turn that trash off. Don't want my soul dirty. Don't want my mind dirty. <laughs> you know when God gives you a new heart. It is an undeniable power that has come upon you. And you know it. And the holy things that we used to hate, we now for the most part love. When I was younger, I liked church here and there. But to be quite honest with you, as I got a little older, didn't want to be there. There were things about God that I did not like. There were commandments that God had regarding the way I was living, that I did not like. I wanted God to conform to me, not the other way around. But the things that I once didn't appreciate, didn't understand, didn't fully know the value of, the things of God, the things I used to hate when I was younger, I now love with every ounce of my being. You have no idea. Some do. God had to give us a new heart in order to make loving Him and obeying Him possible. Because without that new heart, you will not love Him and you will not show Him you love Him through your obedience to His Word. You cannot and you will not. And some people try to do it religiously in their own works. Just so that way they can carry the name Christian and hopefully get to heaven. That's powerless. It must be done by the power of God and you must know it. That's true conversion. True salvation. Without this new heart, we cannot and will not love God back. I know that for a fact. Number four. This will be my last point for today. A new song. Behold, I make all things new, and the Lord starts to make all things new, and will eventually make all things new. New songs of praise come from a new heart of love and gratitude towards God. This is why I weary when people do not articulate in one way or another, confess with their mouth and words, that they love God, that they praise God for forgiving them of their sins, that they thank the Father for sending the Son, that they thank the Holy Spirit for making them more holy. I question anyone who doesn't regularly praise God because the new covenant promises a new heart that sings new songs of praise. All the new songs that I have written come from the goodness of God in my life. All of my songs stem from appreciation towards the Lord. And did you know that you too sing new songs to the Lord as well? They may not be structured, they may not be published, but somehow, some way, we all sing a little something to God. Somehow, some way. Some little tune, some little melody, some little whistle. 
a few words that kind of sound like a song. Kind of. We can have a sister who may be at home picking up around the house or a brother working out in the yard and they begin to sing, Lord, you, you've, been so, you've been so good to me. You know. Oh, I love you more than anything. I'm, that's a song. I mean, they might not play it on the radio right away, but it's a song and it's coming from your heart. Just from you to God. To the only ears that matter, by the way. <laughs> but we all sing songs somehow of praise to God. New songs that we sing to the Lord when we're alone. That's a song. Some of you sing today's songs. But because you're like my brother Danny. And you don't remember lyrics too well. You change the words. <laughs> it's kind of like a new song. <laughs> that the main author would not like, you know. <laughs> That's not what I said in my song. <laughs> Doesn't matter if sing a new song, bro. The Bible says sing a new song. And I'm using yours. <laughs> but that right there would not be Kanos, that would be Nails, right? Because you're renewing the other guy's song. <clears throat> in Psalm 40 and verse 3a, King David says, he has put a new song in my mouth. King David. He has put a new song in my... Where's the song come from? Him. That's why when I write songs, I always say, God gave me a new song. Because I know the kind of songs I wrote before God came into my life. <laughs> Dirty. Prideful. Foolish. Do you know how the Lord did that? How the Lord... Put a new song in David's mouth. I just love the picture, right? Like this unworthy clay cup is given some words and a heart and a mind to worship the God who made him. Because apart from God putting songs in there, <laughs> nothing good comes out. Nothing. Thank you for putting songs in us, Lord. So how did, God, how did God put a song in David's mouth? Turn your Bibles to Psalm chapter 40. I want you to read verse 2. This is just before David says, He has put a new song in my mouth. How did he do that? Why did he do that? We're going to get a little hint right here. Psalm 40 and verse 2 says this. He... Also brought me up out of a horrible pit. <laughs> That'll make someone sing. <laughs> I was once in that pit, but now I'm not. Thank you for your grace, oh God. You know, whatever. <laughs> I hated that place. There was no light. It was all alone. It says, out of the miry clay. So this was some muddy, icky, gooey stuff you couldn't walk in. And then he says, out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. Why and how did God put a song in David's mouth? God saved David from a terrible situation and that salvation turned into a melody in David's heart. That's how that happened. That's how it always happened. Something great about God, something he did, something about who he is, something that he has done for you or someone else turns into a song of praise. King David was a composer, a songwriter, a musician, a psalmist, a worshiper through music. That's true. But God always gave David reasons to write and sing new songs. That giant was about 10 feet tall, you know. <laughs> Maybe he didn't sing like that, but I'm just saying. But then I took him down by the name of the Lord and I chopped his head off with his own sword, you know, whatever. <laughs> That's what he did. 
And he gave God the praise for it. If I stay here any longer, I'm going to start rapping, so I'm going to wrap this up. No pun intended. <clears throat> or maybe just a little. The call to sing a new song is found in Psalm 33, Psalm 96, Psalm 98, Psalm 144, Psalm 149, and Isaiah 42, 2 and verse 10. In short, we sing fresh praises, new songs to God, because His mercies are new every morning. In Revelation 5, 9 to 10, a new song is sung by the four living creatures. These are majestic and regal angels and the 24 elders, which some say are representative of the church. You don't believe me? Turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. We're going to read 9 and 10. This is a new song that is sung in heaven. This, this, this is incredible. This is absolutely incredible. We get a little bit of, of insight, a little peek into what they're going to be singing in heaven. And by the way, this is the song of songs. The lamb that was slain for you and I. Nine. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. They're singing that. We're singing that with them. A new song. And in Revelation 14 and verse 3, the 144,000 Jewish evangelists sing a new song, listen, that only they know. It's a secret song of praise and worship. We will continue this message next Sunday. There's so much to be said. I pray that your spirits and your hearts are stirred. Look around you. Do you want to be a part of this? As far as the world goes? I don't. I don't. All the confusion, all the lovelessness, all the pride, all the hate, all the false religions and false religious ones, Everything in this world is absolute death. I don't want to be a part of it. I want to be a part of the kingdom of God. We want to rescue people through the gospel message of Christ. But this world is not our home. We are not of this world. That's a fact. Let's pray to close. Oh God, one day, hopefully here very soon, we will be singing in that same choir with the four living creatures and the 24 elders and the nations of the world who believed in you, multiplied thousands and millions of saved souls, our brothers and sisters in heaven. We'll be singing with them that same new song. We'll be thanking you for your blood. I pray that we start now. In Jesus' name. Give God praise for his word.